Well, of course, but that hurt the South greatly. Yeah, and also yeah. some of the slaves, there was more of them, they revolted, they left. I mean, I, why are you so convinced that slavery ended for moral reasons? Well, I don't think it ended solely for moral reasons. Wasn't it economic? I mean, it's inherently... No, no, but I'm saying in the United States, I mean, this is a point that I think is very well documented by Fogel and Ingerman, and that is that there really was a very, very high rate of return to uh, to, uh, to slavery in the no, United States. No, but I'm not disagreeing the economic... In the it. short run, it's good, but the yeah. long term, they're eventually going to revolt if there's too many, if they're... You know, they overwhelm the white population. I mean, clearly, at a certain point, they're going to revolt. I mean, it's like a negative externality. Think about it. You treat well, them wait, so... I mean, I mean you're, you're thinking about Haiti. It, that's the one instance where that happened. Or, or the, but the, otherwise, the, it didn't, really. There's, the slave revolts were very limited in nature. And, so uh, why did it end? Oh, as I say, I think it ended largely because of a political cause. I really don't think of the economy... Look, I think if we were to take the economy into the 20th century, that by the 20th century, I think slavery would have become obsolete. We learned to invest in people. But don't forget, in 1860, the level of, le of, of, level of skill in the black or white population was quite low. The level of technology was quite primitive. And in fact, I would argue, you know, there were some real gains to, uh, but to having slavery. As an economist, don't you have to take on the cost of feeding them, clothing them, making sure, sure they don't was, escape? Doesn't that, isn't that a huge cost? I mean, and they, and they can't even be consumers in the market. Like, yeah, but all, all I'm saying is that you had an actual price on the slave. You could actually go to the New Orleans slave market and what you saw was there was a run-up in real prices until 1860. That's a lot. Because there was there was less slave. slaves and there was more. I mean, I just say like eventually it seems like human nature that they're going to revolt as a long-term profitable. Mode. It just doesn't seem like it works. Well, it's not clear. I mean, let me give you a, a, something in between slavery and the free market. Take the case of the indentured servants. Right. We had a, this this practice. Many many Americans came over here. Their families came over, or their their their, their the forebears anyway came over as indentured servants. There it was a voluntary transaction. You had a 10-year contract. The, the planter or the farmer who brought you over paid your fare, paid your, paid your expenses, maybe even trained you. You worked for that person for a stated period of time, five, 10 years. And then at that point, the contract terminated and you could continue working as a free laborer or you could go but That's on. not the same thing as slavery. Well, and it is in some sense because during the terms of the contract, you, couldn't, you weren't free. But at least they have the incentive to work hard because they know there's an end. I mean, you treat someone so poorly, they're going to revolt. Well, I just, wait, 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 wait. You're making a very strong assumption that the slaves actually weren't treated that badly. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the, if I'm a slave... Okay, but there was a movie, The Last Supper. You see The Last Supper? I didn't see The Last Well, that was a movie, basically, in, that dealt with Cuba. They treated them so poorly, they weren't even allowed to relax on Christmas Day. They had enough already, and they revolted. I mean, just the idea that you well, treat... Well, wait, but when we're talking, there were some, look, we know that in, uh, in, in Latin America, south of the border, in particular in Brazil, I don't know about Cuban slaves, I just don't know about the Cuban slave situation, but in Brazil, the mortality rates were very high. But part of that actually was a reason. It's a very good reason. You had an unlimited supply from Angola, from oh. Mozambique, that continued to flow in until like, when was slavery abolished, finally 1880 or so in Brazil. So actually there was no incentive to take care of your property. In the U.S., slavery imports stopped. African imports, they were illegal imports, I'm sure. But what happened then is that it became a real scarcity value. It became really scarce to you. And so what happened? What happened was the typical slave was not whipped and beaten. Some were. There's no question about it. There was abuse. But if you treat them poorly, that poorly, you admit that that could actually backfire. Yeah, but I see you're missing the point. No, I am. The, I'm the not, owner would have the incentive not to treat right, them Well, poorly. I'm saying that, that I have professors here who argue there's neo-slavery now and that there is an incentive to treat them as poorly as possible, and I got condemned for thinking like that. But why? I mean, what, I mean, so the point is, again, you'd have to ask them a basic, very basic self-interest point of view. I agree, I and I was condemned that. for writing this paper, and that was, <laughs> I got, I got the worst this? grade. Colonization's history. Yeah, the history. Well, look, I have no doubt that in this uh, university and in many other universities. In the that, social sciences. In, in social sciences and humanities, there's a general bias against economics. Look, even in Brazil now, the econ economics that's taught when you go down to sort of a middle level university is really the economics that uh, is, is a version of Albanian communism, Albanian Marxism. It's an extreme kind of Greenspan's Marxism. book, he talks about populism in Latin America being crazy. Does that, here's my argument. Does, does the ideology and the lack of education when it comes to economics start in college? No, because I think it should start earlier. No, 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 I'm not saying, but like this, the root of the fact that so many people don't understand the power of free trade, where does that, do you think it begins in college that they are taught a certain way, high school, where does that begin? No, but actually, see, I don't know if you've ever been to Italy much. Or, you know, I went for four days, so you have much okay. more expertise. Well, if you go there, you'll hear a discussion about what's called the Cato communist culture. And it really, you have to understand that it's not just communists and it's not just 
uh, the Catholic Church, and it's not just one group or another. But there are many, many organizations and institutions that actually strongly are against the market. They feel strongly that, that, that the relationship between two individuals is always one of explo one exploiting the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very con hard concept for people to understand there might be gains to trade. Mutually beneficial. Mutual beneficial, but that is a very tough concept. But I learned this in high school, Ricardo, comparative advantage. I mean, these are basic things if you're But a lot of people don't fully understand that, and I think that's where we fail. Yeah, but and I how do we teach? Because that seems well, remember, things we teach, remember yeah. the religion. I mean, a lot of religions still, whether it's Islam or, or sort of really devout Catholicism, or whether or not, I would guess, and look at Buddhism probably more than any other religion. And uh, many other religions really are talking about the fact that we need to adopt a different approach towards our dealing. I mean. I remember once reading a book on Hindu economics, and there were two solutions to, this, <laughs> two to right the problem. Yeah. One was basically to produce more goods, and the second was to want no goods. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's certainly a solution, but I honestly think that there is a feeling, there's a repugnance to the market. There's a feeling that somehow market transactions are fraudulent, the people are being cheated. And I think this is glorified in part by the, the media, but I think it goes deeper. I think a lot of the institutions in society simply don't understand the structure of how what free trade is all about. You just said a you know, key point, comparative advantage. But how many people understand that? How many people really understand that? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of opportunity cost and the ratio exactly. and stuff like that. And, and but it should be taught, like of all things, like to mandate well, who's to gonna Shakespeare. Teach it? But who's going to teach it? I mean, that's the trouble. I mean, you're going to get people... Te I mean, look, here they come to you, you teach 100 school. teachers, prepare them how to teach it. I mean, so Okay, but it's, it is true right now that there isn't a single good high school economics textbook. I was told that Alan Kruger was writing one, and I haven't seen it. I took it. an IB econ class that was good, showed monetarism, Keynesian. We got a pretty balanced perspective. But where did you, uh, what was the textbook? Was there a textbook? I don't, yeah, it was called IB econ. I, do I know the details? No, but I, I learned, I mean, I learned both sides. The, the government intervention, pro-market. I mean, I, I had a good textbook. Okay, well, I'm surprised. I would like to know the author. I mean, there are a few good textbooks, and there actually has been a very good um, book recently put out by Partha Dasgupta. Very mm -hmm. small kind of economics in one easy lesson. There was a book, famous book by Hazlitt put out maybe some 50 years ago. But the fact of the matter is my own daughter, for example, was, was over here at the lab school, and she wanted to learn some economics. So I looked around for textbooks for her to read. There was a book by Tom Sowell, a pretty good book, but it was very discursive. It went on too long. And then, But this book by Partha Dasgupta, well, that's a pretty good book. I think that actually creates a pretty, uh, gives you a fair shake, an understanding of what the economic problem is. But I agree with you. There's a certain level of economic illiteracy. And the way that we've traditionally taught economics is exactly arguing, well, you know, it's something for the more advanced person. I, I just, I, yeah, I don't think it has to be like that. No, it doesn't. Here's no, a I basic point on free trade. Another one, like, one, you know, after World War One, all these countries uh, went towards, like, protectionism, isolationism. And if, correct me if I'm wrong, the numbers show poverty was as rampant as ever in the world. Oh, thanks God, worse. Exactly. Import and once we started embracing more free, free market principles in the 70s when Nixon opened up China in the 80s and 90s, I mean, the U.S. economic growth has been a lot of prosperity, and the world there's been a lot of prosperity. The more free trade, it seems like the more there is economic growth, in and general, you raise poverty. I mean, you in general, there is decrease poverty. No question. But let me give you some. I mean, think about what's happened in, in Latin America in the last ten years. That's a very good example of what all the problem is that we're talking about. There, you had an experimentation. You know, the so-called Washington Consensus of the early '90s. Mm -hmm. You had a lot of economies that took to the free market. Argentina, in particular, was really under Menem, was very much embracing the free market. Now that failed. From the but the question is, why did it fail? And I think the wrong lessons have been extracted from those failures. Now, what, I don't think it failed because the market was free. In fact, it, what, why it failed in part was because the market wasn't free enough. Right. You never, they, Menem and his group never were able to break the strong stranglehold that the unions had on the labor market. The amount of labor protection, the rigidity of the Argentine labor market was phenomenal, remains phenomenal. And then, of course, there were aspects of corruption. So the municipalities were issuing debt, and so there was a lot of fiscal irresponsibility. That's why Argentina failed. It wasn't because they opened up the free trade. So we have 